If, uh, if, if you're living in Rhode Island or Providence or even across the nation and you've possibly been living under a rock or you don't know how YouTube works mm-hmm. or social media, could you give the, the elevator pitch introduction of who you are and what you do in case somebody out there doesn't know who, who you are? Yeah, I am Victor Baez, owner of Club Ambition, the Club Ambition multimedia company based out of the smallest state in Rhode Island. But most people know it as just a YouTube channel, um, the YouTuber, podcaster. But yeah, I see it as like a company, like a multimedia company because I do multimedia things. You know, I do photo, we've done merchandise, we've done not really much events. We've done a lot of private events. Um, eventually I might get into that, you know, more event, like hosting type of, uh, gatherings, ticket, ticketed events and stuff and like that. Um, I want to do more nonprofit work as well in the next coming like year. Um, but yeah, I would say the multimedia company based out of Providence, Rhode Island, um, arguably the most popular YouTube channel, um, especially also most popular, like, like spoken about, um, podcasts out of, out of Rhode Island. I've, I've, I've heard things like the Rhode Island content King, the voice yeah, yeah. of Providence, which I, I feel like is, is accurate that yeah. no lies being told there. Um, and uh, hold on, by the way, I might, I might make, make it clear. Yeah. This is not you saying that. This is other people saying yeah, that. Yeah yeah. 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 So like, that's another thing. It's not, not you say when other people are like giving you that, like you've, you've earned it. Yeah. Well, I, I'll walk into like the sauna at the uh, edge, uh, in Cranston and randomly, oh, the mayor of Providence is here. I'm like, where is I mean, uh, Brett Smiley? Oh, me? Yeah, I'm like, I mean, you're calling me the mayor of Providence? I'm like, well, oh, okay. <laughs> I vote for you. And also, I feel like if you ran in the next election, you'd probably win against Smiley. I, I listen, I, I've always like joked about like the idea of like, you know, like, oh, maybe I want to run one day. And like recently, whenever I have like my takes and my opinion just on, you know, the things that he does, I'll be like, listen, you know, I'll, I'll take your job, you know, on a joking way. But at the same time, I'm, I've always have like the thought in the back of my mind, like, if I were to run, like, would I be able to get like 10,000 people to come out and vote for me? You know, because I probably just would need 10,000, maybe 9,000 to beat him. Because everyone's saying in the comments, like, he's never going to win again. He's not going to win again. But then I'm like, uh, that's just the idea of, you know, winning. But then... If you win, you're like, oh, crap. Exactly. <laughs> you're like, oh, wait. <laughs> it's like, am I really ready to be a mayor? You at know the, what I'm at saying? the same time, can can anybody really do worse than that guy? Honestly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's been it's it's been a rough uh was nine months now starting ten months starting. Uh, What's uh, even crazier to me is that I've told friends this and I'm I'm putting this into audio and so hopefully one day I'll do it. I've always wanted to make like a video game, but set in and about Providence, where like <laughs> people in Providence that we know are like playable characters and shit. <laughs> That'd be so. Because I feel like that's be hilarious. Be better than that. Be better than the crap Thirty Eight Studios did. Thanks a lot, Shilling. You what, jerk. what they do? Thirty Eight Studios. What they do? 38 Studios were, they were making this big giant video game and then like they were making up a company and then like all, like there were all the Rhode Island like heads of state and business people were like, it's Kurt Schilling. He has a video game company. He made the Red Sox win. Give him money. And then it went bankrupt because the game didn't do the numbers it was supposed to do because. It came out though? It came out. It was called uh, Kingdoms of Amalur. Like he had an all-star team. He had like Todd McFarlane doing the concept art. He had R.A. Salvatore who's like a known fantasy writer, like writing the story. It was like a, it was a big deal, but like. Everybody wanted to do blockbuster numbers. I'm like, dude, it's a new IP from a from an unknown studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and we just gave them all this money, and then they they were in downtown, like across from AS220, like like they were in that building, and then yeah. like they had they, like two years later after the game came out, they were gonna do like a sequel and shit. Never happened. And this and this, so now the state owns all the intellectual property for it that they're doing nothing with because <laughs> yeah, because they thought like, oh, my kid plays video games, sixty dollars pop, we'll make millions. I'm like, that's not how it works. No, that's and not nobody how it works. on that board. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, I was going to say Brett Smiley gave me like the perfect, like, I'm like, dude, he just gave me the perfect villain for my video game. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be insane. I, that would be, I, that's doable now with these mods with GTA and shit. You could do like probably like a role playing. Oh, no, I'm going 16 like... bit. I want to be like some Streets of Rage. <laughs> Man, th- is, what's that new thing now? Uh, Unreal Engine? Yeah. <sighs> Imagine just kicking that up and just doing something. I mean, Sample size, you could just no. That, do that would downtown. be downtown. That would be the HD remix, yeah. right? When I build the first game, and then the second game, and then I do the third game, then the <laughs> HD remix collection will come out, so I can just get more money for doing the same thing. <laughs> that's true. That's remastering. That's what all these other friggin' video game companies do. Anyway, yeah, at this point, yeah. This again, this may still go into the beginning part. I'll have to edit the introduction into this because people <laughs> are like, what the fuck are they talking about? <laughs> but um, I want to start with. You were, you know, you've 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 said in interviews that you are a consumer of content. Yeah. Before, like, like at first, before anything else, and Definitely. going with that, 
you know, you, you got your start doing reaction videos, which I want to talk about mm-hmm. too. But the first question I have is um, that some of the first content that you were doing, like that, like, that you were getting in were bootleg music video DVDs from the Dominican Republic. Is that correct? Yeah, 100%. So I would get um, sent from DR, my aunts, my dad's sisters would send me bootleg DVD, like literally straight bootleg DVDs that you wouldn't even, so more bootleg than American DVDs that I would get maybe like in the hood or growing up in the South Side, like way, even more bootleg. I'm talking about like the the sleeves were like falling out. It was very thin. Even the CDs for some reason would seem even thinner. It was very unique. And then I would get, um, it was sometimes it would be like a care package. Like anytime either my dad or my mom would go to DR or even if they just want to send some stuff, like it's called a furgon. It's kind of like a, a shipping container, cargo container tank that they'll send from either to DR or from DR with um, a lot of you know unique stuff. If they're sending it to DR, typically it's just random stuff that they want to give away, like any hand-me-down clothing, et cetera, because it's more valuable out there, you know. It's like a third world country level of, you know, poverty that a lot of these these neighborhoods live in, especially where my family's from, Bani and Santo Domingo. It's like infamous for like the poverty there. Um, but they would send from over there, my aunts, actual packages that would have CDs of music, DVDs of music videos, compilations, um, the rawest form. Like I'm talking about like 50 Cent PIMP but the unrated version with a bunch of, you know, nudity, like the titties BT out, uncut BT uncut version, version like in extreme stuff that I, I wouldn't see on my own TV. I'm like, how are, how are they getting this? And I'm seeing this on this DVD. I'm like, oh my God, does my dad know my aunt sent me this? Like, what's going on? And it'll, it'll also come with like these like um composition notebooks that'll have like Daddy Yankee on them and like um rappers on them. Very like unique, like customizable the customized like merchandise, it was, it was, it was pretty cool so looking it's back like at it. People making their own zines, but from like a DVD visual format almost. Yeah, basically, basically. Um, and I guess it was also like my aunt's version of like, hey, we know that you are in America. Here's like our taste of America over here. Let me send it to you, like a taste well, of like, American like culture. This is, this is like how how we're getting American culture exactly through like DVD, filtered through our lens and how we're consuming it. Exactly. Gotcha. So I would get it, and then you know back then that's how it was. It wasn't streaming. It was pop the CD in. You know, I had the PlayStation, uh, PlayStation Two. Pop the CD in the PlayStation Two, and you would watch. You know, whatever you want wanted to watch. It was like a CD, uh, DVD player as well. I remember the PlayStation Underground for the first PlayStation. That's how I ended. <sighs> but that, that's how I found out or heard Genuine's Pony the first time because his music video was in the wow. PlayStation Underground DVD <laughs> or CD, I should say, because it wasn't. It was a PlayStation One, so it's a PlayStation Underground CD, and it would have game demos, but like music and like videos and stuff on yeah, there. Yeah. And it was like a, a video magazine, basically, is what they called it, but they had demos on there. But, like, I remember the first time I heard Jenny Wine's Pony was I had a PlayStation. I popped that in, and all of a sudden, I'm like, bam, bam, bam. <laughs> and it was the video. I'm like, I need to go listen to this guy. This song's awesome. Like, but that's oh how I God. got it. I would, I would give everything to just, like, rediscover, like, or even be a part of, like, that era of, like, being the first time, like, when you hear Jenny Wine just dropping that song. Like, such a, like, classic moment. Looking back at it, I would imagine being back then... Being there, it would have been even more classic. Like I'm only laughing because there is um. So you being a consumer of media, there's yeah. a King of the Hill quote. It mm. was like Khan, and he was like super sad, and he would just like literally. They're like Khan, why are you sad? He's like, I just realized I can never rehear a song for the first time ever, and that depresses <laughs> me. And I'm like, he's got wow, that's like a really good point, but also it's really sad when you think about it. You know, it's crazy. That's one of the only like um like funny cartoons I never got into would be King of the Hill. South Park and Futurama, but everything Those are like else. My three faves. But everything, too. everything, everything else I watched. Like, I would be more than happy to entry. You know what? We should maybe do like a top episodes reaction where it's just <laughs> like just like you like, reacting to King of the Hill crap. I w- I would love to see that. Even now, like Rick and Morty, I'm kind of like late to the party with Rick and Morty. Um, but yeah, I grew up with Family Guy. I loved watching Family Guy, American Dad. Um, yeah, all that. You know this this was not in my questions that I wrote down, but I think it's a, a good. Like almost like sidebar question. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that the way a generation consumes media, how much do you think it affects on how they create media? Like mm, the way you question. consume media as like a, in your adolescence, how much of an impact do you think it t- it takes or like 
puts a filter on how you create media versus a kid who's consuming media now. Like we were talking, you were talking about how you saw a twelve year old kid in like a pot a podcasting class you were, yeah, yeah, um, that you were ho- hosting and teaching these kids, and he was like, "Yo, I like MF Doom," and he's twelve, and you're yeah. like, "Yo, I want to get that on camera," and that's amazing. But then we were talking about earlier how like that makes more sense in the world of TikTok and YouTube now because it's very easy to go down rabbit holes and find artists who, whereas before, before pre-social media, mm-hmm. somebody finding out about an MF Doom is through like either vinyl or message boards or something like that. So how much do you think a generation consumes media in their adolescence or, form, or formative years then shapes how they create content and how they like develop it and put it out there? That's a great question. I do think that um, it's very significant I feel like I'm lucky to be on the tail end of like one of the last generations to, you know, grow up on CDs, DVDs, like actual tangible media um, because of the fact that I feel like anyone from that generation that grew up even buying a physical CD, you know, that's like similar to like the closest thing that you can maybe compare to understanding more would be like, you know, that's someone that more likely would be able to read a book or cared about reading a book. Cause nowadays this generation is not like that at all. Right. Meaning like if I was able to be more tangible and consume these things directly, I feel like I would, I would be able to do what I do now, which is sit down, talk long form, even in person, talk with people a long time without any issues. But I feel like now this younger generation, like below me, the new generation, they consume content where it's not tangible it's straight digital on their phone, fast track TikTok, 60 second clips where when it comes to 10 years from now when they create the media, I'm I'm worried. I feel like it's no longer going to be, you know, yeah, like that, what's that going to look like? Yeah, it's and not going to be the new generation going to consume stuff compared to like this and then Yeah, you know, it's not going to have much depth. I feel like it's not going to have much depth. It's going to be very surface level type of shit. Like I I, I already feel it. Like and I, I sometimes I try to be like, you know, optimistic cuz I do love you know, the youth and these kids, like, I never want to, like, you know, not believe in them or, you know, give them, like, you know, like, a chance. Like, I do, I'm, I, I, you know, I have I have faith in the future, no matter what, when it comes to, like, you know, these kids. There's going to be some of them are going to come out good. But overall, I feel like, man, like, it's just a, such a fast track minded. Like, I wish that they grew up, like, me having to go to Walmart and buy, you know, Kanye West, uh, Yeezus, or... Not Yeezus, uh, my Dark Twisted Fantasy just dropped. And like, let's go to the store. I have to buy it. I want to listen to it today. I got to buy it today. Oh, I bought the clean version by accident. I got to go return the oh, CD wait, now. the deluxe version with these unreleased songs. Yeah, it's blah, like, blah, what blah. the heck? It's like, they don't understand. I still have the CD of uh, Kanye West, My Dark Twisted Fantasy, and the receipt when I bought it that day and everything. I, I, I would play that CD. I think it's probably not even playable anymore because I played it so much. It's probably all scratched up. But they don't understand, like what that means like now it's just like 12 o'clock oh let's press play this leads to next a, next I, next 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 this leads to a question again another one i didn't write down but i, I want to get it out there because i think it's super poignant yeah um because like rizza did that what was it that the last wu-tang album where he sold it for like an obscene amount of money be- and he has his yeah, explanation a, martin screlly yeah, yeah but then martin screlly now it now belongs to the fbi or some shit yeah he's like that guy's a criminal some crazy show what's going which, on which which because he's a piece of shit so yeah, yeah. i'm glad I'm not necessarily glad the FBI owns it, but I'd rather them own it than like Martin Shkreli own it. Yeah, so, yeah. but he, you know, the RZA, the RZA's reasoning was like music is not considered art anymore and is art. Why? And he was like, why is it that like a painting can go sometimes of like really simple stuff? Yeah. Like I've been to Art Basel and there was like before the banana guy, which that was the whole thing. The guy who taped the banana, then the guy who ate the banana and was like, I shouldn't be charged because it's an art piece, which is. As, art is one of the biggest finesses. I feel like we should yeah. make a fake art show, get a British guy to do like the thing. We'd probably make millions on it. Oh, man. And then and when people get fleeced, be like, well, that you're part of the art project. Now we can sell this <laughs> as an NFT. and the, the, Part of the plan all along. Yeah, exactly, even though it wasn't. But like, the reason why I'm saying all this is because do you think that we're, because this movement away from physical media, to an extent because like vinyl got popular again, like CDs aren't a thing, but like vinyl's a thing. Do you think it's like that because everything is streaming, everything is so instant that the the media that you're consuming is less valued. You know what I mean? Like, like mm-hmm. oh, like, you know, like, I can get any song I want for $10 a month. Yeah. So it's like you value that music less. Like, do you, do you think that that's happening? Or do you think, like, the art is becoming more of a, um, uh, I want to say throwaway. I'm trying to look for the, the, the right 
the the right word here that you know movies and there are art forms movies an art form music is an art form you know even the written word in print there's an art form to it stories are an art form do these become more more of like just like oh this is like it's not really art anymore. It's just a consumable thing. It's a commodity. That's the word I was like. Commodity. It's becoming a commodity now. Where like art's being commoditized because everything is so instant. I do think that. I think. I think that that's definitely happening. Um, now more than ever. Um, even more like like recent times have shown me that this year, especially in the past couple months, with like um two examples with like a the Oppenheimer movie that released. You know, Christopher Nolan, like the way he released it, where he had this major rollout, anticipation built up. Had a countdown clock for like a year ahead of the movies actually and different dropping. Versions, because he was saying it'll be good on whatever screen you want, but if you want the full experience, you need to go see it because that's how we shot it. Yep, and like Tarantino millimeter. did that too. He did the, the special wide format and the roadshow version. Yep. Like when he put out um the Hateful Eight and stuff like that. Exactly, exactly. So that element, I feel like, you know, people loved it. And then with the Barbie is a good example as well, because with the Barbie movie. You had a rollout, and you had them appreciating the Oppenheimer movie. They did pretty good, like rollout mo- uh, promo, the interviews, and they also had a a campaign where it's like you had to wear pink to watch the movie. So you see everyone in crowds of wearing pink watching this movie. So it built up like a more of like anticipation. Like this is not just a movie; it's a moment. This is right? an experience. It's an experience, right? You're getting a whole package here, whether you are not a part of that experience, you at least are be able to, are able to appreciate it. You're looking at it online, you're like, wait a minute, that's pretty cool. Like, I, I'm not going to go watch the Barbie movie, but that's crazy. They're, they're dressing up all in pink. Oh, my God. So then that lives it's on. It's a happening. Exactly. It's a, it's a happening. It's an event. It's exactly. Not ju- it's not just, I'm going to go support this movie. And do you think that, like, reviews or criticism, because that's so easy to put out there now, that, like, it almost adds fuel to the fire? Like, what? no matter which side you're on, like, it almost benefits them either way because, 100%. like, it becomes a happening. It, like even stuff that's so bad, like The Room. I don't know if you're familiar with that yeah, yeah. that movie. Like, I or even, even saw, Morbius. Morbius was like it was like so trash, and then like a year and, and, later, and, and, and or like or if you want to go to the earlier than that, like Rocky Horror Picture Show. Like mm. that was like not that it was bad, but it be, like people don't go and watch like just to watch. They go because they want to like at certain times throw popcorn at the screen or yell or do this. It becomes like a it, it goes from a movie to a performance almost. It's like a different thing. Hundred percent, hundred percent. You know, and at the same time, like everything can't be yeah, impactful happening. you know everything can't be like a moment and that's understandable but you know there needs to be at least an effort to try to make it one and a lot of times you know with this new age you know i feel like you don't see that like especially the majority of stuff happening right now within music you know if you're not an artist that actually has like a theme with your album with your rollout like with your interview you style have to create like a multiverse un- unto yeah. yourself like yeah, you can't just put out music no it has to be like you need the companion book and the thing and the other thing 100 percent. but then here's a question yeah um like a little sidebar underneath that because some people have tried to do stuff like uh all right listen yay fans don't come after me i'm just i'm just stating a fact here like yeah. yay did the stem player thing mm. which easily got hacked mm-hmm. but also it was like here's this stem player that's 200 dollars and it's like it has my album but then he released it later on stream so he like he tried to do a physical and like that flopped yeah so like but even if I you do it like even if you have fame it doesn't always work yeah it doesn't always work and i think what that one was more because of just his backing like he announced it and everything but then once it came out he disappeared you know, he disappeared. He was nowhere to be found. And then eventually the company, I think, like, they just said, like, we're no longer going to do anything with him. Like, we don't want no association with him because of what he was saying in the interviews, et cetera. But it was like, at first... I also it, heard, like, they didn't get the full money they were supposed yeah, to get Yeah, it was like a whole like some other craziness horrible and- business. So, But at first I thought, like, it was his idea. He owns this company. That's how it kind of came off. But then when it, they came out, I bought one. It's somewhere here in the studio. I think it might be in that room. But... Um, it came out and it was pretty fascinating. Like I, st- I think I'm still like, if not the one, one of the only, um, Donda two reaction videos on YouTube up, and I have a bunch of views on it. And it's me with the stem player, literally using it and then playing through it and then showing people how to use it and playing the next song, playing the song sped up, etc. So enough, a, somebody yeah. on Reddit figured out a way to hack it. There was like a browser injection. Yeah, I saw all that. Tracks, and I was just like, well, I'm doing that because I'm not paying $200 for this just to get one album. Yeah, you know, and then like aesthetically, it looked like some Kanye type of shit, like the way it looked, the color. It's pretty dope. I'm like, okay. Um, but when you get it, it's like, oh, this could have been cheaper because it's definitely pretty lightweight, you know, but him just not being a part of the rollout afterwards kind of fucked everything up. Like if he was proud of it, taking photos with it, et cetera, I think it would have worked even more, but... 
Also, Kanye Indian West. flesh colored kind of was like weird to me. Yeah, he tried to make it like a Yeezy aesthetic with like the, like, the skin tone and like etc. I don't I'm know. Like, you could have oh. like done like a green earth tone or something because like it being flesh color. I'm like, this looks like <laughs> this looks like it's yeah. something you buy from fantasies or not fantasies. Um, uh, amazing, amazing store. Some they shit. had like a rainbow color one that um was sampled, but never. I think it never fully came out. But that one looked pretty cool. It looked, almost looked like it got painted on. I'm like, oh, that. I hope that one would have dropped, but it never did. Yeah. So, some of the first content you've ever like. Ever got known for, I should say, not ever made, but ever got known for was reaction videos. Yeah, 100%, yeah. Leading up to that, though, you know, you said you're a consumer media. Were you always, like, when you were, like, a kid or when you were younger, did you, like, want to be a music critic? Did you want to, like, work for a radio station like a Hot 106? Or did you mm-hmm. want to, like, be, I don't know, like, write articles and Vibe or, like, um, you know, I'm trying to think of the other magazines at the time, Source or things like that? Like, was mm-hmm. that something that you were like, oh, I want to be – like a critic of music or I want to like write yeah. about me or be a journalist of music or like host a music video show. Like was that, or like, did you not think about that when you were younger and like, you, were, you, were you trying to do something else? Yeah. Uh, it, I really didn't think about that like much. Um, I knew that I wanted to do something music related because I just loved it so much. I would be the one to read, you know, arrive radar.com, all these blogs. I was like a blog era child. Like I would love reading be a blogs. Blog writer. Yeah, like, okay. yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, I love like, reading why not them. Go in one of those routes. Yeah. I love reading them and consuming the content that way. And like reading interviews, watching interviews, watching freestyles, hearing freestyles. But I never was like heavy into the idea of like, um, myself, like doing it as a job or anything at all. Um, the closest thing I got to it though, we did throw, um, a actual, show like a talent show or like a concert for like independent artists i want to say junior year of high school it was called the rise i randomly thought of the idea like the rise i'm like this is the rise um you know collectively it was a group of friends and we thought about it and we threw it and it was pretty successful um it was at as220 um i think it was like a free event um but people came out supported it was pretty cool but that was like way ahead of its time like I still haven't done anything like that to this day. Like I haven't done events or anything, but I've thought about it and I always like reference that. Bring it back. Yeah, I always reference that. Like, oh, we did one that was successful. Like with any without any following, etc. So if like with the number of files I have stuff and and now I feel like I can you know do something pretty pretty cool for the city eventually. So then, what led to? Um, and I don't know if this is the first, but I I mm-hmm. heard you state that this is the first that like it got noticed. The um, Travis Scott Birds in the Trap reaction video. Yeah, yeah. Um, want to make sure I got that right. Yeah. What made you want to do that? What made you just want to do a reaction video in general? Where you're just like, hey, I'm always just like giving my opinion anyway. Might as well put it in a format. And I, and I understood that you had to upload it in two parts. Yeah. Um. So yeah, like, what what led up to that? Like, were you just were like people just telling you like, hey, you should do a reaction video. Like, reaction videos are a thing. Da da da. Like, what led to that? So we, as friends, me, Marloon, and Eric, my two um, best friends, we were always, you know, just talking about ideas. We wanted to start, like, a clothing line. Um, they thought of, like, the, the name Complex Ambition, and, like, they drew out the logo and everything, and they wanted to do, like, clothing. Um, and also just kind of be known as that. Not a gang necessarily, but just, like, a collective in school. Like, oh, let's be known as that. Like, that's, like, our group name, like, a collective that's name. That's our crew. That's our crew, right? Like, you know, everyone kind of had, like, their crews and stuff. But we were amongst the only ones in classical where we were, like, branding. Like, we actually had a name behind us, like, actual brand. Right? This is what it is, right? We're going to start this clothing line. We never really even started it. But then, you know, Marloon thought of the idea, like, yo, you, we should just, like, do reactions on camera. Like, we always chill. And it's true, we always would chill with Noel, other friends in each other's cars or basements of, or even just living rooms whenever a brand new Drake song would come out or a brand new album would come out. We'd literally wait for it to drop, like count down, midnight, gather together and just listen to it like fresh ears, raw reactions together. We'd be like, oh my God, this is amazing. Or we'd be like, oh, this is not good. So we just transitioned it to camera, but then we didn't have a studio, couldn't afford one. It's like, oh, let's just do it in the car. Because we have a car. We have cars. Like, we can hop in our car. You know, we could do it before school. So the car thing was school. more of a necessity rather yeah. than, like, going with a certain aesthetic. It was just like, this is what we got. This is all we we're, got. We're going to work with this. Yeah, and we gotcha. used uh, my friend Michael's GoPro. I think it was like a GoPro 1 or 2. The early GoPro renditions, you know, so the audio was horrible. It sucked, but it did the job. You know, it was putting out the content. You know, we didn't even have thumbnails back then. It was just raw. Um, 
And, you know, that GoPro, I think I still have it somewhere to this day, but like we were supposed to just borrow it from Michael and give it back, but he never asked for it back. So we just kept it. Um, I still, obviously, you know, he's always, you know, appreciated for life. That's one of my close friends, but um, I always, it's pretty funny, like how we never gave him that, that GoPro back. Like it was like, oh, it was supposed to be just a lender, but it turned out to be something that was, you know, what it became. We were, I think the first video was Isaiah Rashad and we were just driving around the park and then the birds in the trap, we were driving around downtown. Um, I think at that time it was Lupo's, like in the back alley of Lupo's and stuff. Um, and even if you watch that video, like it was such a sketchy, like we had like, you know, some homeless people walking by. Some guy, I think, asked us like if we had drugs. And then uh, we just peeped out the window. And we looked into like the dumpster behind Lupo's and there was like, um, I think like porn magazines or something of that nature, like in a trash. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? So do you think that setting and the craziness added to that video? Like, yeah. The reception it did? 100%. Like, people loved, like, the organicness of it. Like, it wasn't even like, really... Oh, this is something that's not as polished as, like, these other yeah, reaction videos Yeah, it stuff. wasn't. It wasn't polished. It wasn't really edited like that. I really didn't know, know how to edit that much at that time to the point, like, that video had to be two-parted because the file size was so large. I didn't have any Apple product of a laptop. It was, like, an old-school, like, Dell... With horrible, like it was just horrible. It was, just, I think, it was Movie Maker, like the free service that um, I think Windows provides. It was like it was, it was insane. Um, but it got the job done, and I'm like, damn, this is working. Let's keep it consistently going. Um, and it, it took a character of his own. Eventually, I realized, like, oh, you know, like okay, people must like that we're in a car and that we're just being ourselves. And also, we have a brand name, Complex Ambition, right? It's not. Like, oh, such and such reacts. Every reaction channel is like, such and such reacts. Such and this person reacts. To, to be fair, but aren't those channels like their own brand name? Even though like like such and such reacts, isn't that a brand name? You know what I mean? Yeah, but I feel like it would hin it would hinder the idea of like, um. so that's all they do, right? Because you add oh, so, the okay. action Let me to it. Let make sure I, get, I got this right. Yeah. So the idea of having the brand of um Complex Ambition, which then later turned to Club Ambition. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to ask about why, why that name transition, yeah. but um, was that, hey, if we put it out like this, we won't just be the reaction guys. We can do reaction videos, but then we can do other stuff. And because we have a name that's a certain way in a certain presentation, 100%. it lets us branch off in other things, which I think is like a really good tactic because I think people don't realize that like if you look at, I'm jumping into clothing here, but look at yeah. like a Supreme yeah. or like Staple, you know, or Undefeated. Like, Undefeated kind of has the sports connotation they play in that world, but, like, Staple and Supreme can kind of go off and do weird stuff because they're, the names are, like, in such a way and they're design, and the logos are designed in such a way of, like, well, that could be anything. 100%. They're associated with certain stuff now because that's what we know them for, but, like, even in their inception, it was like, oh, okay, we can kind of branch off and do all sorts of stuff. Yeah, yeah, no, 100%. 100%. So, th so that was that was in the, in, that was part of the strategy then with your branding? Yeah, because, like, from the beginning? okay. Because, like, not like fully, but still subliminally, because like like I said, it was a clothing brand idea, right? So like that's what we were. Oh, but let's just call it that on the channel as well, right? And let's keep it going. And then we did do videos early on. It didn't get much uh, attention, but we would do videos like me with my girlfriend, um, like listening to some throwback albums, like talking about them, almost like a version of what the podcast kind of is now. Like it wasn't just just a reaction. It was more of like a conversational type of content, you know. So we would do that. Even though they didn't do crazy numbers, you know, I I didn't mind it. You know, whenever we were out in person, though, it would be amazing how people would call us out by the brand name. Like, oh, aren't you the Combat Ambition kid? Oh, I see your reaction. Oh, blah, blah. So, so I, I like that. How many videos in until, like, because, like, and, like, I'm guessing the trip, like, I know, correct me if I'm wrong, and I want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. But to lead up to that, wasn't the trippy red video the one that kind of, like, put things a little over the top or where, like, things got like hyper realized but if that's the case how many videos did it take because sometimes people do like a hundred videos or a thousand videos and nothing pops off then it's like video a thousand one is the one that does it yeah how long did it take from like those first videos you did until like oh you're like people are recognizing you like how long was that to be honest i i would say it was probably like four videos in like it was like four did it that was, surprise you it did surprise me um Especially now, looking back, it surprised me even more because now more than ever, it's it's very, very rare for you to, to just start a YouTube channel and then blow up on YouTube doing anything right now. Especially now. And even damn near before, impossible. Yeah. yeah, and even before. Damn near impossible. Before, it was easier, but it still was hard. It was still hard. But it was easier because it was like, you know, Lord knows how many new YouTube channels get created every day. It's like th thousands, maybe millions. So being a part of like that era of the 2015 
where 16. it was hey, YouTube wasn't in its infancy, but also at the same time, mm-hmm. you didn't have YouTube creators making big money yet. Yeah, exactly. Like maybe a couple, but they weren't. It's not like there was there was no Mr. Beast of the world yet. No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was a bunch of like vloggers and stuff, and we would dabble into that too. We'll do some vlogs and upload them, even if they and didn't you did do crazy the street videos as well. Um, I remember a couple of Man on the Street videos you've done. Maybe they were only for events, but I remember seeing some of those too. I don't. I don't think I, I back then I did any. I know I'd done maybe during like a vlog, like at a concert, up what interview. Yeah, maybe I've seen, people. I've seen those. Yeah, I might. I might have but, interviewed people outside. But those, weren't, those weren't from. Before, those weren't earlier though, in the early days. No, I don't oh, think okay. so. Okay. I don't think so. Unless I might have like done one or two that I just can't remember off the top of my head, but. I remember doing like concert reviews back then too, and I would do sneaker reviews on that on the channel as well, and they would get a decent amount of views. I just stopped doing them because I got lazy, but I would do them as well. So, four videos in, like and like you said, that's like, mm-hmm. you know, that that's not normal even then. Yeah. Were there any other things you were doing when it comes to like I don't know hashtags or like titling or analytics, or was it just like here's the title, let's see what happens? Back then it was just here's the title, let's see what happens. Um, no crazy strategy. The strategy would be more like social media wise, like posting like a summary of the reaction, like a shortened version on Instagram, hashtagging it up, tagging the record label, the artist, the artist's friends, anyone that had any any association to the artist that we're reacting to, to try to get their attention, right? Um, and that would work. Like we would get a lot of people's feedback, a lot of people's attention. You know, we would DM people um, and it would blow up our following. Our following really blew up on Twitter and Instagram. The original Twitter and Instagram accounts before they were taken down because eventually both got suspended by both uh, companies. But like, we'll ask about that yeah, yeah. later on too. And and they were huge. Um, you know, t- more bigger than we were than I realized myself. Because like, if I knew what I knew now back then, I would have been way more social media savvy. Even though I was pretty social media savvy, but like, I wasn't constantly checking like what's going on with like the account. Like, like for example, what's the algorithm doing? Today, yeah, exactly. You know? Or like, who's following me? Because eventually, like, I was, like, a year late to the to the Post Malone. Like, Post Malone was following us on Twitter. I had no idea. Danny Brown, like, a bunch of, like, rappers, artists were following us on Twitter. I had no idea. I'm like, damn. So it's, like, unexpectedly blew up. Yeah, I'm like, I could have been, like, hitting these guys up this whole time. Like, and, like, that would confirm to me, like, oh, they probably watched our reaction. Like, they saw our video, you know. Uh, that's pretty cool. Like, instead of them letting us know, they would at least give us a follow. And that was awesome to see. But, like I said, I just didn't know. But. It was it was it was blown up pretty quickly. Um, you know, people loved us. To this day, we'll get comments where people always say like we're like the best reaction channel. But I feel like we can be argued as that because of the fact that it's a raw, organic reaction. It's in a car. People love listening to music in a car. It's if it's not me by myself, it's with a friend. It's just the rawest form of like a reaction, music reaction. Like it goes back in the day when you would get in the car, like pop that CD in or pop that you know, that tape in, in the car. Every every car back then would have a tape player or CD player. So it's just like that rawest form of that where now, you know, a lot of people would do it in their room, in their studio. And it's like, it works, but it's like, I don't know, man. Like, I, I love the concept of the, of the car. Like, people, obviously, if you don't have a car, you can't relate, but even then you might be able to relate. Whereas, like, if you grew up... Do it on the subway, it'd be funny. Yeah, or even on the subway, it'd be hilarious. Or, like, if you grew up, like, being in the backseat of your mom's car and, mom, put the radio up. Put up the radio, put the, play the next song, mom. You know, so I just love the car element. I think we we can be argued as like the best like version of like a reaction channel when it comes to music. So this lead, this is actually a good segue into yeah. a couple of questions I have that I was going to do later, but I think it's a perfect time to ask them now. Um, and I actually talked about this with Laura Afonso uh, Buns and Bites, yeah, yeah. which you've had on your yeah, show. That's my homegirl, yeah. Um, but on my show as well, another shameless plug. Do the end of this one, then pick the page or listen to all the episodes, folks. I, 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 I this guy doesn't need that. I need the help. I, I need the numbers. <laughs> I, like I need the help. So go listen. But anyway, um, I was talking with Laura about this too, and I, I feel like I should bring this up with you because it's, it's interesting. How much in like, yes, there's like, like a lot of hard work that any content creator does, especially if they blow up. Yeah. How much is Though, how much of it is just sometimes luck? Because mm-hmm. I've talked with this well with Laura. How much of it is timing on the platform that you're on, mm-hmm. getting in early? Like, like, what do you th- like? What do you think are the are the elements of? Because like you know, there's there's tons of different channels out there, and sometimes you look at a channel that has really high quality, like, and it's amazing, but it's got low, low views and, and they or low following and nothing, and, yeah. and and they've made like 
a ton of videos that are like super high quality and they're, yeah, really yeah. they're working into it. And another one that is like super low quality. Like I've heard podcasts that like the audio quality is crap and they're like, they're recording it on their iPhone, but not even using a good mic. And they have like crazy sub count. listeners and, yeah, sub count. Yeah. and then other ones that are like very well produced on the same subject matter, go in way deeper, way better audio quality. And like, no one cares. Yeah. So like, is there an element of luck? Is there an element of timing on the platform? Like, you know, I think it's, it's like a, bit of everything like it has to be like the stars kind of aligning you know and also to be honest i think it's just sometimes it's a god-given thing like, it has to be like like it's a god thing like it's not necessarily gonna happen for everyone um no matter if you think like it should it's i, I feel like you can't determine that it has to be god but at the same time when i'm saying that i have to give it up to myself where it's like i did work hard like my friends would tell you like to this day they call me crazy because the way that I work is like, if I don't have to sleep, if I have to stay up to like make sure like this is edited properly and uploaded on time, it's gonna happen. Like I've done, I've done that numerous of times where I'll stay up, I don't sleep, especially back then. Whereas like, I kind of had to do it because like the the program sucked like to edit, so it's like this is gonna take so much time for it to save. I need to stay up, make sure it doesn't crash. Because if it crashes, then I have to redo it in the morning. So I'll just stay up all night. And it was, it was, I would go crazy sometimes where it's like, I, I would be falling asleep in class and everything, but I'm like, this is for a bigger purpose. Like this video, we're growing a following consistently. They expect a reaction once a week. I need to upload a reaction once a week. It needs to happen. You know, I'll bug my friends. Like eventually <laughs> they would get annoyed to the point that, you know, um, Marlon's back doing reactions with me whenever he has a chance. But like Eric, eventually, you know, he didn't want to do the reactions no more. You know, he wanted to pursue his own career. Um, but I was very persistent about it. Like if I start something, like I need to see it through. I'm not going to just pick it up and then like, oh, this is whatever. Like there's people relying on this. Like we would get so many messages of kids telling us that we were saving them from suicidal thoughts. I heard about, I, that was going to be another question I had. I heard about that from the Hot 106 interview. Yeah, man. We would like, get that type of shit all the time. And it's like, especially back then when we were kids ourselves, like young adults, like hearing that from another kid, I'm like what the fuck? This is crazy. Like, we're just being ourselves. Like, I'm not aiming here like, okay, let me put on this camera and save a couple lives today. I'm like, no, let me put this camera on and just be myself on camera, organic, talk some shit, be with my friends and talk about this music because I'm going to talk about the music regardless, but I'm going to talk about it on camera, give my opinion, first raw reaction, my opinion, right? And then boom, and then people would love it. Like, people would feel like, oh my God, I feel like I'm in a car with you guys. When you, when you said that in the beginning, when you said that quick word of advice, because we would give advice to the artists, we would act as if the artist would watch you. I still do it to this day. I'll act like the artist is watching my reaction, even if they're not. Like, I'll be talking to them. I'll be like, listen, Juice World, like, you were rapping about all this stuff here, man, but, like, guys, we got to pay attention to this lyric. He said that he, you know, OD'd or, or is not, or, or is willing to OD, like, he doesn't care, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Let's, guys, this is not just music. This is actually, like, a journal. He might be talking... You know, like asking for help is a cry out for help. Let's pay attention. We would do that in all our reactions when it comes to artists, right? So we would care about the lyrics. And then, you know, God, you know, God bless Juice World, for example, passed away from the drug. So it's like, it would be situations where it's like, we would actually try to, if we were able to connect with the artists and maybe prevent them. You know, we've had deep conversations with like a Trippy Red about like his drug use, et cetera. Well, I'm, I'm going to get to that. And telling them the to like stop too. it because, you know, Kids are e are sponges, man. Like if you if you say certain things, like I've I've been around young kids nowadays where like they will like tell tell you like, oh yeah, I listen to um Didi Osama, etc. But then like they'll dress like these young drill artists, they'll talk like them, they'll dance like them, and like they think like they want to live life like them. Like they'll talk about some street share, like they'll say some shit that they they're not even gang members yet or anything. Like they're so young, but like they'll talk like they are, and it's like. Man, it reminds me like how influential music is. So that's why, you know, we are very like very pressing when it came to like how we handle the reactions. Like we made sure to keep it organic, but then also not be dumb with it. Like we're not gonna like give some dumb advice. To, like, we're not gonna be like, oh yeah, let's drink lean just because the artist said let's drink lean. We will be like, hold up, huh, this is a dope song, but don't do lean, guys. Like you know, two side. Actually, this brings up a number of sidebar questions. Um, that I didn't even have planned, but I feel like I got to ask them because they're, they're too good not to ask. Yeah. 
um, that just come from this. So, folks, if you're listening, if we're jumping around a little bit, it's just because I'm trying to get good questions in. Um, so if it's not following my normal pattern of stuff, I apologize. But <laughs> I'm, I'm just, it's too good to not ask at this time. One interesting thing that it brings up is when you're talking about like kids listening to music and we were talking about the um, consumption of media. I didn't even think of this until just now. That I'm hearing other people and I'm going to... I'm 37, folks. All right, I know I'm ancient compared to the young kids today. I, I know, I'm like, I should just hang it up now and go <laughs> off, go off. We, we turned into Soylent Green. If you get that reference, you're even older than me. I don't, I don't get this. Soylent oh, Green was that? Oh, uh, it was an old sci-fi movie in the 60s or 70s where uh, they basically, if you got to a certain age and you were still alive, they'd bring you in a room and kill you, and you got oh, turned wow. into food, and the food was called Soylent Green. And so oh, the main wow. character figures. Spoiler alert: the main character figures out that Soylent Green's made of people. So it's this like stuff that everybody's eaten and it's like Soylent this, Soylent that. It's also a joke in Futurama. But he's like, <laughs> it's people, it's made of people. And they, he was figuring out that like people were just getting old and dying but like he didn't know how and then like, they would bring you to this room and kill you and then they'd take your Jesus and put it, and you'd eat it. Like oh they would God. feed it to other people. Um, anyway, hor- horrific sci-fi movies aside, <laughs> what was interesting to me was that like it's even gone beyond albums now mm. where like oh, I like this artist because I, I got it from this playlist. Or like, what's your favorite album? Like, oh, this playlist on Spotify. I'm like, so you don't even have a favorite album. Yeah. You just have a favorite playlist on Spotify. That's crazy. So like, th- yeah, does that ever like weird, like weird you out where it's like, we're, we're even going beyond that. Like it's like hyper-focused to the point where like, it's not even about albums anymore. It's about like just the song. And yeah. like, they, I love this artist, but they can name like one song and like that's all they know because they got it from a playlist, which is like, again, another way of consuming that we're not used to. Like we're not like, I like this song because it was on the Billboard Hot 100, you know, yeah, like yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. No, 100%. I've had, I've had a lot of conversations with people where it's like, there's a there's definitely an audience of people that were the same audience that, you know, they're so busy that if they're driving to school or on the school bus or they're driving with their family and they hear a song on the radio, that's how they know about it. Like, oh, it's on the radio? You know, so there's a there's an audience like that that now would be the same audience that is like, oh, let me just throw on this rap caviar playlist on Spotify or like these big popular uh, playlists that have a uh, huge following, verified, like good backing, promoted everywhere. And once they press those playlists, they'll just press shuffle on them. And that's how they know these songs and these music, uh, these musicians and these these actual artists. And it's crazy to me because it's like, I understand that. Where it's like, oh, if I'm not, if I'm too busy, you know, music is not your thing. I get it where that would work. But for like the regular consumer, it, it's like, it's it adds to the, you know, the, like the dilution of like, you know, this TikTok era of music where everything is kind of sounding similar. There's no more sense of experimentation or like a sense of refreshingness. You know, people don't mind it because, oh, let's throw on this playlist and everything sounds similar because it's a playlist, right? It's going to be all over the place, but still in the same cohesive like genre or, or sound and vibe, right? So that's what I think adds to a lot of this shit like fucking up. Whereas like you see these kids literally just trying to make music, especially new artists, to be playlisted because they want to get their streams up, you know? Or, so, like, albums are now 30 tracks long because they want to get the streams up for individual songs so they can have a number of things on the billboard. Number, yep. But then it's, like, you wonder, is that watering the music down? It's like, well, I don't want to make a 30-song album, but I have to to please the algorithms and everything. Maybe, but whereas the album, as an album, may have been better if it was the 10 songs and it was more cohesive, but yeah. it's, like, it's not about that anymore. It's not about making a cohesive album. It's about getting as much streams as possible because yeah. of the, the way everything's formatted now. Yeah, and it's business. I feel like, because a lot of stuff is like, oh, yes, this is a part of business, but it's the effect of business, right? F- business messes up art like nine times out of ten, where it's like, if it's not going in line with what the artistic, you know, pattern is, then the business is going to skew off the actual, you know, artist and audience connection. For example, you know, these record labels now, they'll have these rappers or artists in general release music where it's like, oh, this is a mixtape, right? But it's on streaming platforms. Back then... You're calling it a mixtape just because you don't want to call it an album. Exactly, right? And then sometimes it'll be very successful... And then, then, then it the, does better than the damn album. Exactly right. And then they'll do contract contracts with artists where contractually they have to release, let's say, seven albums. So these artists would get you know dicked around without them realizing it. Where it's like, hey, we dropped this project, 
Um, and it's like, oh, it's not an album. You still had oh, it's seven albums. This is just a mixtape. But because they called it a mixtape, so it's like they kind of played themselves. Because exactly. Because now that you still have to make the album, you're like, son of a. Exactly. And then some artists will be like, oh, you know, this is a mixtape. Like, uh, but it's like they're saying that because the label is telling them that, but they're not telling the audience that. So the audience has this disconnection with them. Like, what is it? What is what's going on? It's like people no longer care about their discographies and like their history of albums. Like. We no longer can remember like a certain artist's with debut. Terms like that, then you start confusing people. You mess and people then there's up. no differentiation. Then it's just going to be like, well, now the consumer's just going to be confused and that they're just, exactly. they're just used to a steady stream of content from you. Yeah. Um, debut albums were like a thing, but now it's like, what is a debut album? We don't know. Was that a mixtape or was that your debut album? We, no one knows anymore. Or is this a collection of stuff that you kept re- drip feeding to us and now that's the album? Exactly. Which, you know what's funny, actually? Going from a music historian standpoint, yeah, that's how albums came about. Because mm. if you think about it, way back in the day when you like, there's, way back in the day of records, kids, um, <laughs> which they're still a thing, but they were called, you know, forty fives were the singles, yeah, and then they were like, okay, when you released enough forty fives, they took all those singles and then put it on a long player, hence why they're called LPs. Yeah, it's a long playing album. Yeah, but the I the I but in the early days of like even the fifties and sixties, it wasn't like let's make an album as a concept. It was let's take all these singles that you that were doing good. Yeah, let's repackage them as an album. Yeah, and then so it's kind of like we've gone full circle. Like we're yeah, yeah. like, history is like repeating itself in a very weird way, which I think is kind of funny. That's a good point too. That, yeah, like we're, we're going back to the we're literally record to go back to the days of forty fives. Here, do these singles, mm-hmm. get the hype, and then we're gonna repackage package the singles as an album because maybe you didn't get all the singles that you had to go physically buy. You could just buy this album and have them all in one and carry one thing around instead of a bunch of 45s. 100%. No, that's which, very true. Which is interesting to me that we've come like full circle. full circle moment. It happens a lot with stuff. Right now in fashion, like baggy clothes is like in again, like no one's wearing skinny jeans anymore. It's like everything's about being baggy. So everything's like, on a 20 year cycle. Yeah. Too. Or now we're like on a 15. It's, it's shortened because our attention spans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, this leads to two questions yeah. uh, that I have. One... Well, he's some more questions, but two poignant ones. There's a, um, I don't know if you ever heard of this guy, Brendan Kane. He wrote a book mm. called One Million Followers. Mm. He's like, yo, I've gained one million followers doing this on this channel, then I did it again. He has a company that promotes um, how they can, you know, use data and analytics and their own proven methodologies that they've used from massive amounts of data analytics, and they work with brands, and they can pretty much, using their method in their company, they can get you virality. Mm. which I think is an interesting fucking claim to make. Yeah. As somebody who has made viral content, yeah. do you think through data and analytics and through processes that virality can either be predicted or maybe not predicted, but like, hey, you know, um, business A, you need to make your video like this because our numbers and our data and analytics are say like, if you make it this way, it's virality will go an extra 10% versus making it this way and you have to target and use. Do you think that can be predicted or you think that it's kind of almost like like voodoo? <laughs> like like they're yeah. saying that, but can they really I think prove it, it? I think it can be predicted um because I've predicted I've predicted it. I predicted it, predicted it all the, all the time. Um especially with a, a good platform I can use as as a sample set would be um was well, X now, but obviously Twitter, but X Twitter, you know, I have tweets go viral damn near every day. And I calculate it, where it's like, I know if I am watching, consuming content every day, I find something interesting from a significant person like a Charlemagne, Joe Budden, et cetera, and I capture that moment, you know, screen record it and repost it on my account, and I kind of like highlight what they're saying, if it's something of an important stature, you know, important opinion, something related to music, you know, a Drake or like, you know, big names that just, you know, are always a trending topic, then nine times out of ten, it's gonna get a good amount of traction, and it happens like all the time. Like, yeah, over the weekend, I had like three viral tweets. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm I constantly have viral tweets to the point like where it's like if I see them get enough traction, I'll just mute them because I don't want to get notified about them at all. And then I'll look back at them and I'm like, oh shit, this went more viral than I realized. So it just depends the type of content. Like repurposing someone's like content news wise, very I think it's easy to go viral if you calculate that, but. Like your own stuff, it gets tricky. And I, and I was going to uh, to be fair, I wanted to make a counterpoint. I, yeah. wanted, to, I wanted you to finish your thought, but I want to make a counterpoint. Do you think that those, you know, you're saying I can predict, I can predict to go viral, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. But do you think that that would be the same case if you didn't have the, pl- if you're like somebody new? You know what I mean? Like if you're, if mm-hmm. you're like your first couple months or whatever, like if you didn't yeah, have, yeah. if you didn't have the, the virality of what you've done before, 
Like, out of nowhere. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, would those tweets actually go viral? Like, if somebody else did those same tweets and did everything the same, but they just don't have your name, would that actually be the case? Yeah, it depends. I mean, you can, like, nowadays, there's, there's like, a new era of these young streamers on, like, this new platform uh, competing with um, Twitch called Kick, um, which is a content creator, train wreck. He used to be, like, a Twitch streamer, huge guy, millionaire, and, like, he invested into this company. Now he has other co, like, investors, like, Aiden Ross, et cetera. And they bring in a bunch of younger creators. Um, prime examples right now is some kid named Neon. He's like a big streamer. Um, and Sneeko. But a lot of times, even Aiden Ross is a good example himself. These new era of streamers, what they'll do is like, like you may have never heard of them before, but then they'll go viral for just saying wild shit, right? Whether it's oh, racist. I got a question about that later. Yeah, yeah. Whether it's racist, borderline racism, controversial. Like they know that if they just say a wild opinion, it's going to go viral. So nowadays you see it, or just do something maybe like that can look wild, like the Island Boys. They're like a viral two brothers. Yeah, I know they did a live show and like nobody showed up as yeah, well, which like, was crazy to me. Yeah, like they, they don't have thing. no true backing or following, but then like now they kind of were like, they died off, you know, didn't get much attention, fell off, whatever you want to use, but then they kissed each other. And then that went viral. Now they're back popping again. Now they're huge streamers. And it's like... You 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 can like trigger someone's emotions and provoke some thought, and that can get you viral. But then I I feel like it's easy to go viral, but it's not easy to like. What are you gonna do with it, right? Some people can go viral, but like what they don't know how to handle it. Can you dive a little deeper when because you were saying about the the reaction stuff? It's easy reacting like not yeah. not, not not reaction stuff, but like taking something that's in the news and then kind of repurposing it. Yeah, yeah. Like that's a little easier. Versus your own stuff. What did you mean by like versus your own stuff? Because I thought that was an interesting statement. I just want you to dive yeah, in yeah. a little deeper so on that. So versus like, for example, um, you know, I've had clips where like I feel like I'm, you know, I have very, you know, good thought provoking opinion. I'm talking, doing my thing on camera, podcast clips, but I'll post them on Twitter, but they really won't do much traction. They won't go viral. I've had some that have gone viral. Don't get me wrong. But then they definitely do not go as viral, as frequent as when I post like someone of a you no know, huge magnitude. Let's say I watched a brand new Mike Tyson interview that dropped today, and then Mike Tyson randomly bites, you know, the guest finger. You know, he bites his finger really hard. If I'm watching that interview, you know, nine times out of ten, I'm usually watching stuff right when it drops. Like within a couple hours, like new interviews, I'm subscribed to all these channels. I'm a I'm a consumer. I love the content. But instead of me just watching and laughing and going crazy, oh my God, I'll do that. But then I'm like, let me actually play that back. Let me screen record this and po post this because people need to see this because I loved it. And then nine times out of 10, it'll pick up traction and go viral. I'm a part of like articles all the time. Like my Twitter account and my Instagram account has been like quoted in articles from all these like magazine companies, news companies, like every week. Like it's, it's crazy. But that doesn't necessarily generate necessarily a, a revenue for me. But... Now with the way Elon does with the with the with the X, where you can monetize your tweets and stuff, it's definitely gonna be in the future gonna be generating something crazy. Like I wish it was a thing years ago because I remember I've had so many viral tweets on my older accounts that would blow up the accounts. And I'm like looking back at, it, I'm like, damn, I wish Twitter would pay me for this now. Like now they're paying, but it's like it, it sucked back then. Like looking at that, like oh, but now you know. I'll take advantage of it, whereas, like, now it makes me want to post even more, you know, because I know I can get some money from this. Like, I can monetize this now. So it becomes a way of, you know, another stream of revenue for me rather than just the current monetizations I do and the promos. Now I can, like, oh, let me tweet this because not just wanting to get people to know about it, I can actually get money from this? Why wouldn't I want to, you know? So it's it's a, it's pretty interesting, that, that whole new... Thing that's happening right now with Twitter and or X, I keep, I keep, I'll, it'll this, always be Twitter to me. This is opening up some questions for later on, but um, just to kind of stick with the the stuff that brought you to the dance, and then we're gonna get into yeah. the other things. What, in your opinion, makes a good um? Because you you did reaction videos that that's that is the thing that got, brought you to the dance. What, in your opinion, makes a good reaction video versus a not so good reaction video? Like, regardless of finale, like in your opinion, like what makes like I like that reaction video versus another like anybody else's reaction video like what in your opinion makes them good or bad i feel like when you just add more to the actual thought rather than just you know providing the quick opinion like if you're just like i don't like this 
then people are going to be like, um, okay, why? Like, why don't you like it? I'd rather you tell me why. And aside from that, to be honest, I think just a physical, like, like, if you show, like, when I react to music in the car, like, I'm literally, like, literally listen to it, like, dancing, like, you know, if I don't like a song, I'm, like, quiet. And I'm like, hmm, like you can see it in my face, like actual reactions, you know, reacting rather than just like a quick, like, here are my thoughts real quick. Like, this is what I think, blah, 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 blah. When you provide like a full element of a reaction. So you're going to provide a narrative, even though it's your reaction, there's still a narrative to it. Exactly. And, and at, the, at the same time, you know, it's a first raw reaction, meaning a month later, I'll probably have a different opinion, right? Like if an album comes out, like, you know, like, uh, well, this week, everyone's saying that Drake's album, the new album, is, like, the worst, his worst album, or, like, uh, one of the worst albums this year, right? And I feel that way as well. But then maybe a month from now, I'll probably feel differently. But it's funny, wh whereas, like, these videos live online forever. So I still get comments on older videos where people will be like, you're so stupid for thinking this. And I'm like, I'll comment back sometimes, like, bro, this was three years ago. That was how I felt about that song and that project it, at, that, at time. that time. Like, this that's is a, a time capsule. Time. Yeah, it's a time capsule. Like, that's how that felt at that moment. I don't longer, I don't longer feel that way anymore. But like, I'm also, I, I'm doing other stuff. I'm not going to make a video. Maybe, maybe for like, entertainment purposes, I'll do like a retrospective, like reaction of the reaction, which is funny. But yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, I'm a reaction of my own reactions. Yeah, yeah. Um, but like, you're not going to do that all the time because you you never get, would get to the new stuff anyway. Yeah, exactly. It would have to be worth it. Like with this Drake album, I probably will do it because someone suggested in the comments, like, you guys should react to it again a month from now, see how you feel. And I'm like, oh, that's actually, I'll probably do it because, you know, this one did good in view numbers, so I'll probably do it again. I think it would work. So when it comes to reaction videos, um, there's one particular one that even you mentioned, the trippy red one. You yeah. mentioned this earlier. Can you just walk through why that one was kind of like, my in my humble opinion, it seems like a watershed moment for you and and like your channel and everything that you were doing. Yeah, why that one? What was if you could just walk? If you don't want to get the long, I feel like the long version would be a whole separate podcast. So if you could just give like maybe the short quick summary, timeline yeah, yeah. version of just like why that one in particular was like a watershed moment and like how that all came about. Yeah, I feel like the trippy red moment for us was especially for me. I would speak for myself. It definitely was a proof of concept moment where you put out something to impact and get some sort of, you know, maybe, like, reaction from your reaction from that artist. Like, if you are, you know, listening, you know, we all grew up listening to music and these artists. Everyone has, like, their favorites, you know, or these people, like, you might think in the back of your head, oh, that'd be pretty cool. I, I, if I were to meet them one day, like, I was impossible, but, you know. But the Trippy Red one was one where, like, it confirmed to us, like, okay, this is definitely tangible. Like, we can connect with these artists. These are just humans like us. No one is necessarily bigger or more important than anyone else. It's just an, a sense of, like, they might have something that's more special. They have a bigger following. But they're just, you know, 20-year-olds like us. Like, Trippy, I think Trippy Red's younger than us. So he was a prime example of that right away, you know? And that 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 helped us, whereas, like, we've had some feedback in the past from, like, a Swiss Beats and and um, Isaiah Rashad. Certain people might have reached out via via DMs or comments, but Trippy Red sent us videos, like, mad at us about our opinion on his album. He sent, like, videos in black and white filter, like, pissed off, and I'm like, you know, I'm like, wait a minute. Okay, this guy's mad at us. But the he same stole my filter idea. That <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> he had the, you know, the creative capital. You know, the the your Jason's vibe. That motherfucker. <laughs> but then I'm like, hold up, this guy. You know, at first I'm like, at first I was like, hold up. I did feel weird. Like my anxiety was kind of kicking in. Like, oh, uh, what the fuck is this guy? Is he sending us threats? What's going on? But then I'm like, hold up. Let me calm down. It's not. He cares about our opinion. So let me. Hey, you want to talk? Do you want my phone number? Let's call. Let's talk to each other. Brief aside, does it ever weird you out, like, back then or even now? They're like, huh, it's weird. Like, people actually care about my opinion. Does that ever weird you out? I don't want to yeah. take you away from talking about this, but just I wanted to bring it up because, like, I just think that's interesting. Yeah, it does. It does. It does. You know, it, it did back then and it still does now where sometimes it'll be like, you know, people would care, like, even to the point, like, uh, Trippy Red cared about what we thought about your album. And I, we told him that as well. I, I, and in person, I will tell him that. I'm like, bro, it's crazy. Like, why do you care? It's crazy how you care about what I think about your music. But now I've gotten to a point where, like, certain feelings feel like you should care. Like, I care about how people feel about 
my stuff. Like I'm always, I've had deep talks with fans of mine via DM, Patreon, Discord, etc. They'll send me messages of like their opinion and like shit I should do and like you should do this differently and like do reactions with people. We don't love them how you're doing by yourself sometimes. Like we'd rather you do it with someone else in the car. I'm like, okay. Like even if like sometimes I'm like, I don't give a fuck. I'm gonna just do this for myself. Like, I, but then I'll be like, ah, uh, let's. Like, you want to please the fans because they do have a point. Right, so with Trippy Red, that's what it was at that time. Where it's like, bro, you care about our opinion? Like, okay, let's double down. We didn't like the album. Just because you're reaching out is not going to make us more biased. Let's connect. Let's do an interview, you know? And then we did an interview with them, and then that blew up. Because especially we filmed it here in Rhode Island, so people locally were so shocked. Like, what the fuck? How did these guys get to link up with Trippy Red? And why did it happen in Rhode Island? Like, it was such a moment that you've never seen. Like, this new generation has never seen it. Maybe with, like athletes etc but rappers there's something about a rapper like every athlete wants to be a rapper damn near you know even even actors like leonardo DiCaprio is like, is like a, he's like a huge like wu-tang fan like he and loves hip-hop Joaquin phoenix make a rap album yeah like you know even Joaquin, like a lot of these actors like there's something cool about a rapper so like us connecting with trippy red maybe at the height of his career here here in the small state of the country I think was so huge for us, even though eventually the interview got blocked, et cetera, had to be re-put up. That moment still lived online, you know, and we still have a relationship with him, a friendship where he'll still call me. Like he called me and played me his whole album before it dropped, like months before it dropped, asked me my take on it. You know, I was telling him to change things on it. He didn't change anything on it. He was like, oh man, I already submitted it. Like this is going to go to the label. This is how it's going to go out. I'm like, all right, you know, but then it, it's uh, it's interesting, you know, I think that we we are our own biggest critics, but we cannot negate the critics that are out there. You know, without an audience, no, nothing exists. Without people listening to this, this doesn't this doesn't exist. You know, if we had a zero following, then what what are we? You know, so we have to care about what these people think. So um, there is moments, yeah, where I do think like, oh, who gives a fuck about my opinion? But then I'm like, oh, they should care about my opinion because also I don't insult people. I'm not like like a. Uh, this shit's off, fuck this shit, I give a fuck about this shit. Like, maybe back then, I kind of would play into that to be funny, but nowadays, I'm more concise. I'll still add, like, a funny, like, energy hyped up, but I'm, like, realistic with it. I'm not gonna be like, yo, I'll never play this shit again. I'll be like, hey, I didn't like this, but, guys, this is my first reaction. This is my first time listening to it, you know, so I'll reiterate that here and there, but, yeah, last night, I got reached out by Tizo Touchdown. He's, like, a huge new artist. He's, like, a Kanye prodigy Drake co-signed huge artist. He reached out. He subscribed to the channel. He, he left a uh, supporting comment. He's like, yo, I'm, I'm supporting you guys now. He watched my reaction to his album. So that still happens to this day. So it's pretty fascinating. And and that one specifically, I like the album a lot. So, you know, it doesn't matter. I feel like even when we say bad things, people still reach out. Like as long as we're giving like a raw opinion, you know, these artists um are going to be tuned in. So this leads to... A question I have, you know, concerning not just um, not just virality and the video creation process, but um, you know, you mentioned in the Hot 106. Or this is more s still on the reaction side of things. Yeah, yeah. I think you mentioned the Hot 106 interview. You were talking about money and monetization that of doing um, I guess like sp almost like sponsored reactions where like the yeah, yeah. wants you to react. To yeah, stuff. commission commission, commission reactions, reactions from record labels. Yeah, can those just when you when you like kind of like look at what what you're saying like not what you're saying but like look at the idea of a commission reaction right yeah, yeah, yeah. a record label is paying paying you to do a reaction can they ever be 100% honest because the label or the machine that makes the thing that you're reacting to is paying you to react to the thing yeah that that, that uh, hopefully that that made sense that question yeah cuz there's like a sense of biasness like oh yeah no 100% listen like an inherent, there's going to be an inherent bias because you're getting paid to do that even yeah, if listen. you're transparent and you say hey i got paid to do it still yeah listen i've always been 100% transparent with those because of the fact like i didn't even want to do them at the in the beginning we would get commission reaction offers like crazy i'm talking about like thousands of dollars years ago when like the industry music industry had like way more money than it does now and we would turn them down, especially like Eric, my partner at the time. Like, he would like be like, "Oh, that's not. We don't want to do. We can just keep it authentic. We don't gotta do no pay reaction." But looking back at it, I'm like, "Yeah, we should have been doing them because we could still keep it authentic." Like how we said earlier, like even if you don't like something, that's still gonna get it attention. Like, let's say 
you trash something. Like, oh, this is this is the worst album they ever released. It'll create interest. It'll create interest. Like today, we upload the uh, the Club Admission Podcast Cap episode 105, and the title is "This Is Drake's Worst Album," the new album that just dropped, and that already I think is going towards you know 10,000 views on the podcast episode alone. And that's like one of our most viewed podcast episodes in a while. Like just not clips from the episode, but the full episode getting 10,000 views for us. You know, it's hard to do locally. Like you don't really see that. So that's huge for us. But it's because of that take, right? People like, oh, this is his worst album. But, you know, with these commission reactions, the most recent, like, um, what's it called? Fork in the road, I guess you could say for lack of better terms, was when we did, I did the Cardi B one. What was it? Cardi B and Meg Thee Stallion bongos. It was like a new single I dropped, I think, last month. And I saw I, that reaction, actually. Yeah, I didn't like the song. I didn't like the song. I'm like, oh, it's okay. And and But then that was a commissioned one, right? But then sometimes it'll be a commissioned one where it's like, I might have already won. I was going to do that one because it's such a huge name, right? But it ended up being commissioned. I'm like, okay. Even more bang for my buck because I probably was going to probably make probably 10 bucks, maybe 5 bucks on this from YouTube at, at all. So like, oh, now a label's willing to pay me? That's awesome. But then with that one, they reached back out when they saw it. They were like, oh, it's a bit negative. Can you change this and that? I'm like, and I'm like, no, because the whole I point of my channel this. is the trust that I built of having raw first reactions that yeah. defeats the whole purpose I couldn't of the change, thing yeah. that got me famous that made you reach out to me in the first place. Exactly. So I'm like, I can't change this. I can't, you know. What I did change was the title because in the title, I think I had WAP with a question mark. Mm-hmm. Oh no, WAP 2, something like that. Because I'm like, is this like WAP 2 or right, whatever? Right, right. So I changed that for them. I'm like, I'll change that. Like, but I'm not gonna like, how can I, it's already up? Like, well, how can I change it? Like, I sent them the draft and they were like, it's okay, you know. So they actually give approval and then they're like complaining about it afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. This sounds like network notes from like a TV show. Like, we approved the episode, but now we have some notes. Like, we want you to just like, well, yeah. But that, that'd be like releasing the episode on TV and then can you make modifications? Like, no. It's crazy because I always wonder, like, who, how do these reaction, like, how does that work? Like, I'm assuming these regular labels have like a marketing budget they set aside and they have a team of people that, oh, reach out to reaction channels to get promo for the song. And but what, are the artists, how to react. yeah, but are the artists like actually tapping in? You know, I don't know. Because sometimes, you know that this is happening in the Yeah, scenes, exactly. Like, which is they, a real interesting question. Exactly. I wonder if they even realize it's happening. Exactly. You know, because I know that sometimes it'll happen. Whereas like artists, I'll get some recognition without realizing at the time that they watched, excuse me, they watched it. For example, like a Machine Gun Kelly, like I did his album and then I was a part of his documentary. Like they posted my reaction in his documentary and then his um, producers like followed me on Instagram and stuff. But that was like probably damn near almost a year after the reaction was done. And I'm like, oh shit, this is cool. But that reaction didn't even get much views. It wasn't like a viral reaction or anything. But they thought it was good enough to put in the documentary. Exactly, right? You know, and even then, you know, there's been some documentaries in the past where, like, we'll sign off, like, licensing and we'll get some money from it, but it'll probably be, like, $100, nothing crazy. Um, Like, the XX Adaptation one, I think we got paid, like, $100 for that one years ago to be, like, I think on a BBC documentary, something like that. Um, But, yeah, it's a, it's a weird thing. It's definitely a weird thing where I always want to keep it authentic. But then it's like, I'll get it if it's like, if I'm like offending them damn near. But it's like, I don't do that. So for them to tell me like, oh, this is kind of uh, negative. Can you change it? It did kind of fuck me up a bit. I'm like, okay, what the fuck? Like, I was willing to be like, if they were to be too like strung up on it, I was ready to like email them back. Like, well, guys, you know what, I'm going to just delete this. Like, take the money back. Like, it's like yeah. I don't care. Like, it's not because I have a brand. My brand is just being authentic. Like, that's what everything I do is just being authentic. That's what gets me to where I'm at. That's what's gotten me everywhere That's I've gone. That's what brought you to the dance. Yeah, so it's like, why would I want to, like, change that up, you know? And there's been some commission reactions in the past where it's like, I'll find myself in my own thoughts, like, while I'm recording, like, they paid for this, so should I not say that? Like, where, where the fuck where am I being? What the fuck? And I'll stop myself. In my, I'm like, hold up. Let me just keep it authentic. Like, what am I doing? But it does fuck with you. Well, it was like, they're paying for this, so you feel like, oh... Are they paying for this to be a good one or like, yeah. it, you know what I'm saying? But it's, it's, a, it's a slippery soap. It's a slippery soap, but I don't mind it as far as like, I'll do them because, man, I have bills to pay. Like sometimes like they'll, will, they'll be willing to offer to pay certain amounts of mon- a number of, of dollars where it's like, oh, 
that's a huge chunk of the studio bill, the rent for this month. So I, I'll definitely do a fucking commission reaction. You know, why not? You know, and and it's like, I feel like that's going to pick up soon more. I feel like their budgets are going to open up more, hopefully. Um, especially like, as they see like certain moments, like our Drake reaction did good numbers on YouTube. So today we got emailed from a different record label that emailed us in the past to do reaction, commission reaction, but we said no to them. But now they're reaching out today again and the same email thread. So I'm like, oh, this is going to be interesting. Like, I want to hit them. I want to respond to them because like, you know, they're asking me what's my rate now. So I'm like, oh, okay. This is going to be interesting. So it's, it's, I'm happy for that to see how that goes.